just, I love listening to people's stories, listening to what inspires them and then what then in turn inspires us. Our next conversation will be that. The topic is in search of happiness. And Professor Peter Singer, who we heard earlier this morning, he will be on the panel, along with Simon McEwen. And Simon was the Australian of the Year for last year, amongst other things. He's had a very remarkable life. And leading the discussion is the glorious Geraldine Doog. Please welcome them all to the stage. Well, look, I am blessed to be here, as Jessica said, with two splendid uh, Australians, and I'm, I'm uh, sure you agree it's going to be wonderful. We only have a... We're very... We've been urged to be extremely disciplined as we try to think about what lives a happy life, uh, what makes for a happy life, how can we live a happy life. And I have as my guests, of course, Professor Peter Singer and Simon McKeon, both of whom have very broad lives uh, that, to which they contribute but to which they've also contributed a great deal to the Australian public conversation, and I'm thrilled to uh, be speaking to them about this topic. I was thinking, and I was just explaining to them outside, there's a lovely quote from um, the uh, English novelist G.K. Chesterton. Some people have everything in life except the ability to enjoy it. And I've, uh, I've wrestled with that for many years, particularly as I've seen us become a more prosperous country. I, pre I appreciate that's something around, around which one has uh, um, apostrophes, but that in the midst of lots of overt plenty, uh, there's a struggle for something which brings a lot of you here today. So I'm going to uh, ask our two special guests to wrestle with that a little bit, but just picking up on Jessica's invitation to stories, and I couldn't agree with her more, I did think it was worth posing both of them the question, before we get into a little bit, thinking a bit more deeply, about whether they have pursued happiness in their own lives. So in order to sort of just get a little bit of your own narrative and the story, and I know you've already spoken, Peter, but just to be very personal for a moment, mm -hmm. is it something that you've consciously thought, I want to pursue, or do you find that something that you don't approve of? Well, I think there's a sense in which we all pursue personal happiness. I don't think we really have to say to ourselves, I'm going to make this my goal. And in fact, one of the things that I suggest is that if you do make it directly your goal, you're less likely to find it. This is something that the ancient Greek philosophers already talked about. They called it the paradox of hedonism, that if you pursue pleasure directly, it recedes from you. But if you do something else that is worthwhile and important and that engages you, you find it. And I think that has been the story of my life. I don't know that there was a conscious decision, but I got interested in philosophy, I got interested in ideas, and then I also found that this wasn't just a matter of you know, intellectual speculation, like being good at solving chess puzzles, but it was actually something that really mattered in the world, and that's what, to me, made it fulfilling. And I, I think for a long time now, I have seen my personal happiness as, as linked to the idea that I can have some impact, can make a difference in, in some way in the world. And do you sit back from time to time and say to yourself, gee, I'm happy? I say to myself, I'm very fortunate in my life. I'm, I'm fortunate, uh, I mean, as I just said, I'm fortunate in having a career where I can do things that I enjoy doing and that engage me and are important. I, I'm also you know, very fortunate in my personal relationships. I've had a marriage that's lasted more than 40 years now. I have lovely children and now grandchildren. I, was sort of, I, can, I can feel all that. So I think, I, think I'm, I'm, I am fortunate that so many aspects of my life have gone well, and yes, uh, I do think about that from time to time. But you don't say I'm happy. All I right. don't actually sit down and say I'm happy, but that's a bit too static for me, I guess. I a say bit I'm too static, right? Yes, okay, right. we'll explore that. But, uh, Simon, as well, a... Uh, Geraldine, for me, um, I'm not at all embarrassed to say that I'm interested in happiness, that I seek happiness. And funnily enough, over the course of the last um, 12 months, when I had this extraordinary opportunity to crisscross the country the so often, yeah. And uh, 
Whilst I was asked by all sorts of different groups to talk about different things, I'd always try and find an opportunity to talk about the non-for-profit sector, that great sector that uh, does all the stuff that neither government nor um, business can, can attend to. And I guess, Geraldine, what I was really trying to say was that there was an opportunity for all of us somewhere, hopefully, to make our own little contribution to that sector. And part of my little talk, of course, was all about the fact that why? You know, why do we get involved? Why should we get involved? And unashamedly, I said, there's got to be a selfish aspect to it because, you know, when we get the formula right, we find the right cause, the right people, the right organisation, etc., give, give a bit of ourselves to it, one of the many things that come back to us is simply happiness, fulfilment, call it what you like, but it's a positive feeling. And I go out in the front foot and say, I'm not embarrassed to say that I'm actively seeking that sort of sensation. And so you will say to yourself, I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, you asked Peter the question, <laughs> <laughs> am I happy? So hard? Well, you know, look, I, I seek it. There's, I, I've declared that to a thousand people now, I guess. But am I happy? I'm happy enough. I'm just an ordinary person that um, sees all sorts of things around that, that make me disappointed, you know, unhappy, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not delirious if that's perhaps part of, you know, behind your question, but I'm happy enough in myself. Yeah, see, I just think this is interesting, because I think every now and again, it is incredibly therapeutic to sit back and say to yourself, if it's true, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy. Uh, but I think it's, and I just detected both of you, and I thought you'd both be like, the, the reserve, oh, if I say it, you know, it sounds <laughs> smug, it, it, it's too elusive, it'll go away the minute I say it. You know, this is what I think. These are the unplumbed uh, interiors, I think, about this discussion of happiness. Well, well I, I said that I thought it was a bit static, and I guess thinking about why did I say that, I mean, it suggests that you're content with things as they are. Yes. Um, and I think both Simon and I would say we're, we're not content at all. You know, yes, we may be fortunate in various aspects, but we're aware that there's a much larger world out there with many people who are miserable, um, and we should be doing things about it. There's great injustices in the world. And it's hard to just sit back and say, you know, yeah, here I am, one of the fortunate most fortunate 1% in a world of 7 billion people where there's more than a billion living in extreme poverty. And, uh, you know, I'm also concerned about billions of animals that are suffering through the things that we impose on them in factory farms and being exported to Indonesia or wherever. And, and I find it hard to just sit and say, oh, yes, I, I'm happy despite all, all of that happening around me. But see, that's the thing. In a way, you're saying that if you, if you were to acknowledge happiness, it might make you complacent it might settle you down to do nothing. I'm wondering if that's so. In other words, the notion that it, that it stalls you and that even paralyzes you, why should we assume that, Simon? Well, I don't in the sense that uh, I guess Peter and I are a couple of peas in the pod in that perhaps happiness for us is actually focusing more on, um, you know, that deep inner sense that, <sighs> Uh, it sounds corny, I know, but we're doing the right thing, you know, that, that we're actually being true to what we believe in. Um, it's not to say that we change the world and we make the whole world a wonderfully prosperous place. That's still work in progress. But, you know, deep down, I think what, we're, what I'm focusing on anyway is um, uh, simply trying to be at peace with myself. And, you def and so when you're dealing and with a lot of the people in your philanthropy work, mm. you are now dealing with some very wealthy people mm. who've certainly got the means to supply themselves with a calm life, a life of yeah. security. How do you find, because I know that this drives a lot of what you do, mm. how do you find, do they think about happiness? Well, I've ended up in a very interesting place. You know, I still work a bit in the business world and, and have a bit to do with, you know, some of the wealthiest individuals in this country. And yet, you know, I'm called to do all sorts of other things as well. So part of my existence, Geraldine, is bringing those two worlds together. And, um, you know, the reality here in Australia is that unfortunately, we have serious wealth. You know, we have 35 billionaires based on the last count. But in truth, not one of them 
um, is what you would call generous uh, by standards that are uh, commonly accepted around the world. So therefore, I'm interested in getting under their skin a little bit and saying, you know, how can we <laughs> change that a little bit? And it's very interesting, I think you described it very well, that some people spend an awful lot of time, I mean, I would say actually creating a cocoon. Uh, and, and I don't know whether they say we're actually just looking for happiness, but they're looking for a whole bunch of things. Um, you know, material security, good family life, peace, calm, you know, everything they need. But actually, when you really drill down, f if they'll give you the time and you really drill down, at some point they will come to a wall and there is actually something missing if that's their entire existence. And it's, uh, I guess, you know, for me to try and find creative ways for them to feel good about giving of themselves, their money, you know, whatever it is, so that they can leap over the wall and actually experience something they've never, ever experienced before. Are you sure? In other words, maybe they are creating a life uh, where they are satisfied by their own yardsticks and they have given a lot to their families and that's what they're seeking to do. I mean, are you sure you're sort of peddling the No, I'm not the sure. In fact, um, it, it's, it's a very good question, Geraldine. I'm not sure because this cocoon, which I described, can be um, such a special place for them that they're oblivious to what actually mm -hmm. is going on in the rest of the world. So I take your, your question very seriously, but for me, my job is to say, hey guys, we don't live in a cocoon, we actually live in a world. And you can't, in all seriousness, just travel through this time on Earth being oblivious to the fact that, there's, uh, that you're part of a bigger world. Peter, in the notes that you provided all of us uh, to, to think about, um, you had the story, it was a beautiful story, of uh, um, a fundraiser, I think, told you the story of a very wealthy man coming in to, well, maybe I'll actually let you, because you'll probably tell it better than <laughs> me, <laughs> being asked too little, that he actually wanted to be asked a lot uh, of him, and nobody did. And he wanted to create something of value. This was this wonderful line. I want to create something of value, he said. Why won't people ask that of me? I, I found that very interesting. Yes, I, I found it a very moving story when, when I was told it. It was somebody who'd been appointed as a fundraiser for a hospital that needed to expand. And she was told to ask the, uh, a man who owned the neighboring land to donate it to the hospital because they couldn't afford to buy it. And she was warned that he was a very crusty person um, who had been asked previously for donations but had refused and uh, you know, this was going to be very difficult because he was very, very tight, very stingy. So um, she uh, said to him that uh, she'd like to talk to him and ask him to come in and she had a very small office. She described the scene, they were sitting very close. And she said, look, I really need you to do something important for the hospital. We need to expand. You have this land. We can't afford to buy it. Is it possible that you could consider donating it? And to her surprise, um, rather than you know, refusing or being angry, he actually started to tear up. Um, and he said, you know, I know this hospital's asked me to donate money before, but they've asked me to give $10,000 or something like that, and I've been insulted um, because that means nothing to me. Um, and you at least appreciate that I have the ability to do something significant, um, and I want to do that. And he ended up not only giving the land, but giving tens of millions as well to that and to, to other causes. And later on, many years later, um, he, there was an occasion where he gave a, gave a speech and he asked the fundraiser to attend, and he said he wanted to draw attention of the audience to this one woman who had changed his life because by teaching him how he could do something really significant with his wealth, she had enabled him to be happy in a way that he had not been before. Mm. And I, I found it a fascinating example because I think uh, it's exactly what Simon was saying about the, the, the billionaires we have. They've made large amounts of money because that was the thing to do. They started to be in business, no doubt, and they were successful at it, and you make money, and you continue to make money, and you see more opportunities, and you make more money. But they often don't stop and think, what am I actually doing this for? Um, and it's when you stop and ask that question that you can see that money gives you the ability to make a huge difference.
And I mean, I think Simon and I were talking just before we came in about Bill Gates, who I think mm. is a wonderful example of that. And maybe you'd like to talk about, about that and that connection. So. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Well, just very briefly, um, uh, I actually just flew in from London uh, this morning and I'd spent the last uh, two days in the Gates Foundation office. And uh, uh, all around the, w the walls of that place are, uh, just ooze the fact that, you know, there's a lot of money behind it. And anyone who saw the Bill Gates interview when he was out here uh, briefly over summer, I think he was interviewed on the ABC, and uh, he said something like, you know, building Microsoft was just the most amazing opportunity, uh, the ride of your life, I think he said something like that. Um, but then he said, but it just doesn't compare to what I'm doing today. He said, period, it doesn't compare. And uh, that's, I guess, Peter, what I'm trying to say to, you know, the, the, the billionaires and here. What, and what does he mean? What he means is, and I guess I've had the opportunity to take that a little bit further, but, you know, he says, I get up in the morning now and I'm on a mission that is a so much bigger mission than just building a world's biggest IT company or whatever he was on about. Uh -huh. And, you know, he's not actually a particularly, um, oh, I was going to say cerebral, that's, that's the wrong word. He, he's not flowery. He just calls it as he sees it. And he says, look, I'm just being honest. I feel really good trying to solve some of the world's uh -huh. biggest problems Okay, so where does this leave all of us who are not likely to <laughs> <laughs> set up anything like Microsoft? Uh, how, do, um, how do we apply this to our own lives, uh, ordinary lives, where your ability to change the course of things, well, it may be the way you deal with your children or with your friends. Or, uh, how do we, because it can seem very humdrum, I suppose that's what I'm getting at, you know, I suspect that a lot of the search for happiness, the fact that people come along for the seventh consecutive year to this conference, suggests a really big drive for something a bit majestic in their lives. That's my instinct, even if they don't name it. I suspect there's a lot of very, very good people here doing a lot of things, but there's something that sense, well, it might be just plain they can't derive a sense of joy, but it might also be that little sense of, oh, it's all a bit humdrum. Now, have you both felt that in your lives, in all honesty, even when you're doing good things? No, I don't really feel that it's, it's a bit humdrum. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't moments where you feel that what you're doing is, is humdrum, but I suppose... I, I feel that I'm part of something much larger than me, and I, and I don't mean that at all in a religious sense. I rather mean it in a, the sense of, of being part of a tradition um, that is trying to make the world a better place, and it joins me with many millions of other people in the world. Um, Which is very of Jewish, them. of course. Maybe it is, yes. Yeah. Um, maybe it is. But I don't, as I say, you know, then it's, it's not something I identify no, in a religious sense, but more I perhaps know. in a cultural sense. That, um, that there is this tradition that, that has existed for a very long time, uh, and, and you're part of it. And even if your own contribution to it is not huge, um, and certainly we can't make the contributions that, that Bill Gates can, um, nevertheless, we can feel part of that. And, and to some extent, I guess that's, that's the team feeling. You know, we, we like to feel part of a, a team, but in this case, it's not just that, you know, it's, it's one football team rather than another, and basically you know that there isn't really any difference except that you happen to have chosen this one to support. But it's rather that you feel that this is the right choice that you made. This is, this is a group that is working for, for good or for better. And I think that isn't really humdrum. I think that's something more, you use the word majestic, and I like that word, <laughs> that works. Geraldine, I was on a train when I was reading my Blackberry and received the invitation to be at this conference. I commute by train every morning when I'm in, in, in my hometown, and, uh, and I said, nah, I've made a rule not to, um, I've got a whole lot of stuff I need to do this year, which I didn't get done last year because I was on the, you know, speaking all the time. And, and I was trying to work out a nice way to say, no, I can't be in Sydney for this conference. And I actually gazed up to think of what the excuse would be. And I saw a whole lot of crowd, I saw this crowded carriage with people hanging from, uh, you know, whatever they are, the hangers mm. and blah, blah, blah. 
and I saw a whole lot of unhappiness. <laughs> and actually, I said, you know what? I need to actually come to this conference. I'm not an expert on happiness. I've done it my own tiny little amateurish way. But I think it's important. I don't think it's humdrum. I think it's fundamental to um, you know, the importance of us as a species. And uh, it was confirmed as I looked around the train. That it was all, they all said to me, kind of without uttering a word, you need to go to that conference. <laughs> <laughs> <But what? laughs> well, well, that is a choice. And, and it clearly, it, it made you feel good for, for making that choice, which was not just about you. What, what, but for those various people, doing their duty, turning up to work, mm. Uh, fulfilling their duty, maybe, as um, caregivers, et cetera, et cetera. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about, the sort of the banality of hanging on to the, you know, exactly. the toggle. And, um, but maybe you really are doing something that is quite virtuous, but it doesn't feel like that. Well, it may not, but the chances are that morning, though, the train driver, who has an intercom system right throughout the train, and in Melbourne will often be a migrant, sometimes does his best to brighten us up in the morning by saying something that's often corny and stupid, but he gets a laugh out of all of us. Mm. Yeah. Just doing his job, driving a train, but in a creative way, trying to spread a bit of happiness. How good's that? Well, I must say, one of the, we haven't got time to go into my sort of particular obsession, and I've given a couple of speeches about the need to counter the impersonality of the current world, so that all sorts of just emphases on the personal in the way you deal with people is, is certainly doesn't have the majestic feel and it's not the great glorious thing but I actually think it's an, quite a radical act mm. because so much you know of call center call centers the sort of degrees to which people have become widgets uh, but, but vital parts of a chain that used to possibly be undertaken by machines how does one react to people in I, the numbers of people who come into life, how do you do that in a way that it's, it's, not, it's not giving to the, it's not the poorest, but it's, it's sometimes people with no or less dignity in our midst. Um, that happens to be my personal little passion. Um, right. Trying to think through what that means in life. You know, that Richard Sennett, that very good American writer who talks about the terrible problem in a lot of modern working societies where a lot of working people feel they have simply no dignity. There's no dignity in being a janitor. That was his great line. Mm. Well, there should be. Absolutely. <laughs> but how do we confer that? You know, how do we all take a decision to confer dignity on individual people? Yeah, I, I think you do notice that in different societies, actually, that, that the way people relate to each other as individuals face to face. Is, is different. I mean, I think it's, it's moving back and forth between Australia and, and the United States. It's, it's different in those countries, and I think it's different in a way that I like here, actually. I think there's a more natural kind of friendliness. Americans can be polite and you know, say the right thing, but somehow you feel that they've <laughs> been told they're just saying the right thing. And I think Australians tend to be a little more direct and open, but usually in a, in a positive and friendly way. And I think that you're right, we can, we can make a difference at that face-to-face -face level. It's not only what Simon and I have been talking about, about global poverty, but it's also your immediate circles where you can also feel that you're, you're making something. Which kind does of give you quite a buzz, actually, because mm. often you, you get something back from people that is really very rewarding. Mm. Um, now, I can just see Jessica moving, so I suspect I've got to look at, look at my wind-up. I don't want to forget that G.K. Chesterton, some people have everything in life except the ability to enjoy it. Now, I asked you both to just think about that. Um, is the, do, is the, does joy follow just giving to others, or is there something that else that you, that is about the personal, that, that sense of a serenity within that we ought to just talk about before we close for this morning, Simon? Um, we are all individuals, and um, I think one of the reasons why the Chesterton quote is true is that we often um, actually aspire to the wrong things. You know, we're informed by modern media, the advertising world, you know, whatever, and we try all that stuff, and for some reason, you know, we spend lots of money on it, but it just actually deep down doesn't work. And one of the wonderful things about what Ida said earlier on was, um, 
you know, just looking at the roses, walking along uh, a coastal shore, you know, whatever it is. If we are all individuals, and one of the secrets to all of this is being true to ourselves, the relationship with ourself is actually an important one. And as Ida said, it does take time. And that time isn't spent by being informed by the rest of the world what that relationship actually is. Mm. So, uh, yes, yes, I, I agree. And I also noted what, what Ida said about that. And I, I certainly think, you know, I take time off when I walk along the ocean or, or swim or go hiking in uh, some of our wonderful national parks. And, you know, you can sit on a, on a mountaintop and, and look around. And I do have, you know, great feelings of joy and, and serenity from knowing that this part of the world has been preserved. and is still beautiful and, and really a sense of wonder about that. So I do think that's very important. Um, I don't think, at least for me, it, it can't be part of my everyday life, but it's important to take those moments and take those times when you, when you step back and can do that. Well, there's a, isn't that great Oscar Wilde line, be, be yourself, everyone else is taken? I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. I just absolutely love it. <laughs> and uh, you can see I make notes of these little aphorisms to trot out. Uh, well, look, ladies and gentlemen, I've found that terrific to hear, and I hope you have too. Will you please thank our special guests, Simon McKeon and Peter Singer. Thank you.